You know, we've also been told that uh, by two different witnesses, we have been told that the uh, bomb squad was in front of the federal courthouse that building that morning at 730 and that they had already cleared the Murrah building. So there was something strange and unusual going on that morning because we got a bomb squad down there clearing buildings before 730 in the morning. And then we have this rumor, which I subsequently confirmed and I spoke with the gentleman regarding what the ATF agent said. That's not just a rumor. I've spoken with the man and that did happen. Is there a Middle Eastern connection that is not being pursued by federal investigators? The very existence of John Doe II has been denied despite eyewitness accounts of his presence in Kansas and in Oklahoma City on the day of the bombing with Timothy McVeigh in the Ryder truck. From the very beginning, we have what probably is the most massive manhunt in our nation's history for John Doe number two. And that lasts for a week, maybe two weeks. And then all of a sudden, the FBI comes back and says, there was not really a John Doe number two. That it was Mr. Bunning came into Elliott's uh, shop maybe 24 hours after McVeigh rented the truck and that everybody's just confused. Well, if everybody's just confused, we've got a lot of confused people. We not only have Mr. Elliott, who still maintains privately to his friends that there was a John Doe number two and that there was not only one more person with McVeigh when he rented the truck that day, but there probably was two. And that it wasn't 24 hours later, it wasn't 24 hours before. It was the morning that McVeigh rented the truck. And uh, Mr. Ellis not going public. He won't talk to anyone in the press, but this is what he's telling his friends, that it uh, doesn't matter what the FBI says, there was a John Doe number two there. Now we have, in Oklahoma City, we have McVeigh stopping at a tar shop at 10th and Hudson the morning of the bombing, about 20 minutes to 9, getting out of the rider truck, walking over to a young man and asking him for directions to Fifth and Harvey. The young man tells him the directions and then McVeigh gets back in the rider truck. I've talked with this young man as recently as this morning and he tells me he's standing no more than eight feet from the truck and he sees John Doe number two sitting in the passenger side of the rider truck at 20 minutes to nine, and he sees McVeigh sitting there in the truck who he just spoke with. He indicates to me that this John Doe number two is possibly, could possibly be a Middle Eastern looking top man with a baseball cap on. And this is what he told the FBI immediately after the bombing. The morning of April 19th, I was working at Johnny's Tire Store. Um, at about approximately 8.25, a rider truck pulled up into my place of business. At that time, a gentleman asked me for directions to Fifth and Harvey. I proceeded to explain the location of where he was asking me. He seemed to be a little concerned of where I was telling him about. At that time, the gentleman, Timothy McVeigh, stepped out of the truck. I walked him over to, let's say, 10, 11 feet away from the truck itself. I pointed a direction downtown, which is to my right. He, uh, seemed to acknowledge where I was talking about. At that time, the gentleman walked back to the truck. I talked to him. I also noticed there was a passenger in the truck at that time. From uh, that point in time, the rider's truck seemed to stay there about another five minutes and headed the direction I explained where it was at. What did the person in the truck look like? The person in the truck looked to more be of a Caucasian, Middle Eastern, was not an African American, was not a he was not a real light complexion. He was not blonde hair, light skin. He, uh, at that time, I, I, he, uh, like I said, they didn't stay very much longer. Was I didn't. He wearing a cap? At that, yes, also, he was wearing a ball cap. Timothy Vey had his on backwards, which, just like this. It was on his head. The other gentleman had his on like this. They really didn't acknowledge me so much. They, they, they didn't really seem that they were that concerned. They didn't seem nervous. They seemed to be more lost. They came in from the west. They, they pulled into our business, kind of a caddy quarter angle. From there, they proceeded right to go south downtown area. How far is Johnny's Tire uh, Company from uh, the Marlboro? I'm located on 10th and Hudson. The bombing took place on 5th and Harvey. That would seem one block over, five blocks down. I'm to the north side of the bombing. Four days after the bombing, or three days after the bombing, 
they government took me downtown to identify the gentleman and what I can understand I did identify the gentleman as being Timothy McVeigh did they have the passenger which was with McVeigh was he in a lineup also no he was not at that time that I've never even actually seen at that time before the John do actually two number come out I'd never even seen a photo a sketch nothing like that and also when I did identify Timothy McVeigh I had not even seen him the only way I'd ever seen him was through a sketch on a paper at Daly, Oklahoma. What's your motivation for telling the American people what you have right now? Are you in this for I, money? I'm not in this for anything but to let people know that I, this is what I've seen. I feel at right this point in time that I will, or should I say I might be a witness in the bombing itself, but as far as me actually being motivated for any other reason, I have none. I just want to let people understand this is what I've seen that day. You know, and then nothing's going to change my mind whether I testify or not. This is what I've seen that day. Oklahomans have been affected by this terrible tragedy. 169 people lost their lives. We feel compelled to bring this information to the American people. This is a, a perfect example of a very credible witness. He was extremely reluctant to even sit down and give me an interview for a book. At the time, that I contacted him, he did not realize that I knew what he already knew, or that I had an inkling about what he knew. Uh, this individual had gone outside of the building to smoke his pipe at approximately, oh, let's say 15 or 20 minutes until 9 o'clock that morning. Uh, he was in working in a building, the Journal Record building, which is directly north of the Mira building, less than 100 yards from the front door, from the door of the Mira building. As he's out there, he notices a yellow Mercury parked up against uh, a uh, what they call the Athenian building, and it is the, the uh, it's facing him off slightly to his right, with one individual in the vehicle. That only reason that he remembers that is is that you don't park there. The parking is spread out in front of him. That's where you're supposed to park in, in the authorized spaces, and this car's illegally parked. Uh, he then remembers it's Wednesday, it's laundry day. He's a blue-collar guy. He's a pressman. He's supposed to turn his dirty uniforms in from last week for clean uniforms on Wednesday. So he takes off to the west down a, uh, an alley and goes around the corner to his pickup truck, gets his laundry, and is on his way back to the... Uh, area where he was smoking his pipe and at that moment he looks up and sees the yellow mercury and now there are two men in it and it is racing towards him it, when it gets within just a few feet of him it s makes a sharp swerve turn to the right and it jumps a couple of curb guards and at that time as it's swerving in front of him he sees the man that he later identifies as Timothy McVeigh and the olive-complected Middle Eastern man with a ball cap on that he says is a perfect description of what the FBI sketch is. In fact, he says he helped the FBI with their composite. The car jumps the curb guards, and as it does, and it is racing away, he's watching this vehicle very closely because it is almost running down, and he sees a license plate. And it is not an Arizona plate. It's, an, it's a white Oklahoma plate dangling by one bolt. He, of course, is struck by that because it is about to fall off, and so this settles into his memory. He then goes inside the building, goes back to work, and within just minutes, maybe two or three, four minutes, maybe five minutes, you know, it's hard to say, it's hard for him to remember, but a very short period of time later, there's the blast. He is in a semi-protected area where he is, and he does survive the blast with minor injuries. He helps some people. He put out a small fire. Then he goes out the west side of the building, joins his co-workers, the rest of them that are pouring out of the building. Many of these people are seriously injured. Immediately, as he joins the circle of workers, he looks over just a few feet away, and in the middle of all this chaos and blood and crying and screaming, here is another Middle Eastern person standing there staring at the mirror building with a smile on 
from ear to ear. He said it was the most chilling thing that he could, he's ever seen in this whole thing, in spite of all the injuries. As he looks back over it, it is, it is spooky, it's chilling, it's sickening. But he said the man was almost in rapture over what he was looking at. And after having interviewed 40 or 50 people that were in that building and injured that day, and all their experiences around there, believe me, there wasn't a single soul and 